Sulfur has marked the progress of mankind since the beginning of civilization. He first found it in deposits left by old volcanoes and on the edges of sulfur springs. Since then, it has played a role of ever increasing importance in his life. Primitive man regarded with awe the stone that burns, and he believed that burning sulfur would ward off foul fiends and evil spirits. Doctors in ancient Egypt knew the medicinal value of sulfur. They made salves and ointments of sulfur which they prescribed for various skin conditions. Soldiers of ancient Rome struck terror in the hearts of their enemies with flaming weapons made with the magic burning stone. During the Dark Ages, alchemists who were half chemists and half magicians clung to belief in the magic properties of brimstone or sulfur and burned it in vain efforts to transmute base metals into gold. Meanwhile, in China, it was discovered that a mixture of charcoal, sulfur and nitre would explode. Gunpowder was to change the history of the world. As the centuries passed, and alchemy gradually gave way to true chemistry, ways of making high-strength acids were discovered. At the same time, a modern kind of magic began to unfold industrial magic. The industrial revolution ushered in a new age. Now, great demands were made on the budding chemical industry for the supply of old, weak natural acids and alkalis was insufficient for large-scale industrial use. The demand for sulfur zoomed, for during the space of a hundred years, several basic industries appeared, all requiring sulfur. The rubber industry was born with the discovery that rubber could be made useful if vulcanized or heated with sulfur. Synthetic dyes made from coal tar derivatives treated with sulfuric acid replaced the rare and expensive natural dyes. And it was discovered that applying sulfuric acid to phosphate rock yielded a superior fertilizer called superphosphate. Machines to make pulp were invented, another process demanding large amounts of sulfur, and the growing steel industry required still more sulfuric acid. This expanding industrial appetite for sulfur was to require millions of tons of the yellow element every year. Virtually all sulfur in the United States had to be imported until the turn of the century when Herman Frasch invented an ingenious method of mining sulfur. His process made it possible to recover the rich deposits buried hundreds of feet below the coastlands of the Gulf of Mexico. These vast deposits of sulfur are found in characteristic underground structures called salt domes. The method invented by Frasch for removing this buried sulfur involves drilling a well through the cap rock of the dome to the sulfur-bearing limestone below. When the well is completed with three concentric strings of pipe, water, heated under pressure to 320 degrees Fahrenheit, is pumped into the formation. The hot water melts the sulfur, but does not mix with it. The melted sulfur, being heavier than water, flows downward, forming a pool at the foot of the well. Hydrostatic and pump pressures built up in the formation caused the molten sulfur to rise about halfway up the pipe. Compressed air released near the bottom of the well bubbles up through the sulfur column, making it lighter and causing it to rise to the surface. 
Today, most of the world's supply of elemental sulfur is produced by the fresh process from these Gulf Coast salt domes. In modern sulfur production, wells are drilled with standard rotary drilling equipment. Four-man crews working around the clock drill down to the rich layers of sulfur which lie from 600 to over 2,000 feet below the surface. A thousand-foot well may reach total depth in 48 hours of drilling. After the drill has passed through the cap rock, core samples are taken from the sulfur strata. Quantitative analysis of these cores tells the relative abundance of sulfur in the formation. Once into a producing formation, the well pumping equipment is set. The three concentric strings of pipe are run into the well and connected to the air, water and sulfur lines. Then hot water and compressed air are pumped down the well and aerated molten sulfur rises to the surface. An air trap vents much of the excess air from the sulfur. At this mine, the vented air passes first through a lime bath scrubber to remove any offensive odors. As the sulfur is recovered from the underground formation, the pipe in which it flows joins others of a network of collecting lines. Inside these sulfur carrying lines are steam pipes providing the heat that keeps the sulfur molten. The lines carry the sulfur to the nearest collecting station where the production from 20 to 30 wells is gathered. The collecting sumps may be hooded to prevent the escape of fumes. This molten sulfur pouring night and day into dozens of collecting sumps is a never ending tribute to the ingenuity of the man who unlocked this buried mineral wealth. Known worldwide as fresh processed sulfur, with a purity exceeding 99%, this vital element is now one of the most widely used chemicals in today's technology. From the sumps, the sulfur goes to measuring tanks where the amount of sulfur taken from each lease is automatically measured and recorded for daily royalty and tax reports. The removal of thousands of tons of sulfur from the underground formation causes the earth to settle or subside. This subsidence of the earth has one very beneficial effect. By collapsing the mined out sections, subsidence limits the mining cavity and helps to keep the hot water in the area where mining is going on, thus maintaining the rate of recovery of the buried sulfur. However, this earth movement may sometimes shear the casing, destroying an expensive well. In areas where frequent shearings occur, it is possible to enter the sulfur deposit laterally, thus avoiding the area that is expected to subside. This technique of directional drilling is also useful for exploiting offshore or other underwater sulfur deposits. Maximum recovery is further aided by careful spacing and grouping of wells, thus conserving this valuable natural resource. In producing sulfur, each well uses several hundred gallons of superheated water every minute, as well as quantities of compressed air and steam. With dozens of wells producing at once, a constant supply of water is vital. Specially constructed reservoirs store water from wells or nearby rivers and feed millions of gallons a day into the mining operation. Before it can be used, the water usually must be softened and clarified. Chemical treatment and filtration rid the water of metallic salts which would form bothersome scale in the piping and boilers. 
the soft, clear water is then ready to go into the power plant. This is the very heart of the sulfur mining installation, producing steam, electricity, hot water, and compressed air, supplying all the power needed for the mines and the auxiliary equipment. Every major operation is controlled automatically, while banks of gauges and recording devices keep a constant watch on the plant's activity. The boilers which generate the steam are fueled by natural gas from nearby Gulf Coast fields. The abundant supply of this fuel makes it possible to produce economically the vast quantities of steam that are essential to the production of sulfur by the fresh process. Steam drives the turbines that produce the plant's electricity. Steam runs the compressors that supply air to the wells. Steam operates the pumps that handle the water. And steam is used to superheat the mine water in jet water heaters. For greater efficiency, the mine water goes through two steps of preheating. First, it passes through heat exchangers to absorb heat from the boiler flue gases, shown in red, which would otherwise be wasted. The warmed water then goes to the deaerating heaters where it condenses exhaust steam shown in white from turbines and other equipment and utilizes this heat before going to the jet heaters for final heating. Thus, much of the heating of mine water is done by energy that would otherwise be wasted. Final heating of the water to a temperature of 320 degrees Fahrenheit is accomplished in the jet heaters utilizing steam direct from the boilers. From the power plant, the hot water, steam, and compressed air are piped to the wells, sometimes a mile or two away. The pipes carrying the hot water are so well insulated that the temperature of the water drops less than two degrees in the trip from the power plant to the mine. But once into the formation, the water cools rapidly and must be removed to make room for more hot water. This is done with bleed wells located at the edge of the dome. The bleed water removed from the formation may contain impurities which require treatment before the water is discarded. In the treating plant, dissolved gases are removed and burned, and solid impurities are settled out. The cleaned water is then discharged through canals into estuaries of the Gulf of Mexico. Although sulfur is fairly abundant in the Earth's crust, it is not always found in deposits of the pure element. It may occur in chemical combination with other elements. Sulfur combined with hydrogen is the foul-smelling gas hydrogen sulfide, which occurs in sour natural gases. Such sour gases are the raw material for this sulfur recovery plant, which converts an otherwise worthless substance into useful products. The plant strips the hydrogen sulfide from the gas and then recovers the sulfur from the hydrogen sulfide. Thus, it serves a dual purpose, sweetening the natural gas so that it is fit for consumer use, and at the same time, conserving thousands of tons of the yellow element that might otherwise be lost. In graphic form, an absorbing solution, cooled monoethanol amine, or MEA for short, enters the top of an absorption tower. The sour natural gas enters at the lower left. The hydrogen sulfide is absorbed in the MEA, and the commercially sweetened natural gas goes out the upper left. The dark, rich MEA leaves the absorber at the lower right and enters the top of the reactivator tower, where the hydrogen sulfide is boiled out of the solution and the cooled MEA is returned to the absorber. The hydrogen sulfide passes into a furnace where it's burned with a deficiency of air, yielding water vapor and a mixture of sulfurous gases. These gases are converted to sulfur vapor in catalytic beds, and the vapor is then condensed to molten sulfur. Each year, more of the recovered sulfur, as well as the sulfur produced by the fresh process, is shipped overland while still molten in tank trucks and railroad tank cars. In transit, the sulfur tends to insulate itself 
by forming a solid crust surrounding the molten core. When it reaches its destination, a brief application of steam is usually sufficient to melt the crust and start the sulfur flowing. Similarly, molten sulfur is shipped by barge along inland waterways. Many users prefer molten sulfur for its convenience in handling as well as for its mine fresh purity. Large ocean-going barges for transporting molten sulfur carry their own heating plants. Despite their huge capacity, these barges can be loaded quickly from storage tanks where over 35,000 tons of molten sulfur are stored. From these tanks, a 7,500-ton tanker can be loaded in only five and a half hours. In such tankers, the sulfur is kept molten by heating coils in the cargo tanks. The sulfur not stored or shipped molten is allowed to solidify in huge storage vats the size of a city block. The sulfur is pumped to the top of the vat and spread in an even layer over the surface. More layers are added until the sulfur nears the top of the retaining walls, which keep it in place while it hardens. Then the walls are freed and raised in readiness for the next layers. Slowly the vat grows, a half inch at a time, as layer after layer is added until finally the completed vat stands 50 feet high. When the time comes to ship, tractors break up the vat and push the sulfur over the edge to waiting cranes. The giant clamshell buckets pick up the sulfur in three-ton bites and drop it into gondola cars destined overland for factories and chemical plants. Some sulfur is shipped in special hopper cars designed for unloading into pits located beneath the track. Sulfur destined for water shipment is taken from storage vats located near the docks. Here again, tractors break up the sulfur and clamshell buckets transfer it to a line of conveyor belts reaching to the harbor. These conveyor belts weigh the sulfur automatically while carrying it to the dock. Finally, the sulfur is fed into the holes of ocean-going freighters. From the sulfur recovery plants, 
and from the Gulf Coast fresh process plants. Every year, millions of tons of 99 and 5 tenths percent pure sulfur are shipped to the hundreds of industries that use it in one form or another. Some industries use the sulfur in its pure or elemental state, but by far the greatest portion of sulfur undergoes some sort of chemical transformation before being used. When sulfur is burned, it unites with oxygen to form sulfur dioxide. Combining sulfur dioxide and water, H2O, yields sulfurous acid, H2SO3. Or with the aid of a catalyst, sulfur dioxide becomes sulfur trioxide. SO3 and water form the powerful king of acids, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, essential to all industry. Sulfur also combines carbon to form carbon disulfide, or with fluorine, chlorine, 